Welcome to the Behind the Wealth Podcast, where we bring you insights into, jeez, bloopers have started. Welcome back to the Behind the Wealth Podcast, where we bring you insights into personal finance and wealth building. I'm Roger. I'm here with my co-host, Elias. Roger, it's great to be here today. Today, we're going to be discussing a very interesting, somewhat controversial topic in the world of finance, AI-generated financial advice. All right, this is already horrible. We can tell an AI computer generated this, Eli. Yeah. I'm this, is re- not my, this is not my typical... I'm just reading it straight from here. The computer made this. Well, I think what Molly did is she made this as a little bit of a joke here. She says right on here that I generated podcast intro via chat GPT, which is kind of the big talk right now on social media and everywhere is how AI is finally being adopted kind of mainstream by individuals to help them um, do things like this, generate this podcast intro, which I'm going to be honest. I kind of like what they built for me, but I think today is about um, where this AI is actually going. And and I'm actually reading the next generated paragraph of this. And I think this is interesting and we're going to have a little talk about this, but you know, my next lines are financial advisors have been adopting AI technology to streamline their business. Well, interestingly, Eli, I, I don't know any advisor who is directly using AI to improve their business. So the question becomes, are we indirectly using this and we just don't even know that we are using AI to do this? And for those people out there, there, there's someone going, what is AI, right? There's somebody listening right now. They don't know what AI is. AI is artificial intelligence. And due to this new app called chat GPT, you can go there and, give it a topic and it generates data. So I've heard, I've heard that the chat GPT, that kids have been using it for help with school. And then Casey in our office, he t- um, I heard him telling someone that, and he's in law school, the chat GPT program passed the bar exam. They somehow gave it the test and it just passed like easy. Well, so it's really fascinating. It, but to, to your question on advice, so I know we've adapted. See, now I'm almost confused because I know we've done a lot of work on technology in our business to streamline and to provide a better client experience. But I don't know enough about the behind the scenes. Is artificial intelligence part of that? Because I, you know, I know we have a lot of streamlined processes, but I wouldn't be able to speak intelligently on is any of that actually AI generated or not? I know it's technology. I know it's um, valuable for our business, but I don't know if it's actually AI. And to my knowledge, this generated script is the first time our firm has used artificial intelligence. I promise you this. You know, here's what's interesting about artificial intelligence as I think about it. You know, Elon Musk has commented a lot of times regarding artificial intelligence and how powerful it can be. And you mentioned that an AI generated computer passed the bar exam. And I believe it probably is going to be valuable. But the question is, who's where's the liability when something goes wrong? You know, if you're using artificial intelligence as your attorney and something goes wrong, are you then able to who's liable is the artificial intelligence company who generate this liable, who's liable in this situation? Because I, I think I, th- I think I already see where this is going. There's going to have to be some type of regulation on where, when, and how this can actually be used in in the world. And this is so new. It's going to be like crypto. It's probably going to be the wild, wild west for five, six, seven years until they actually figure this out. Yeah, it could be. So do you consider, so like algorithm trading and stuff like that the computer trading that goes on that's artificial intelligence right or do you not i'm sure they're using artificial artificial intelligence and i'm going to tell you what's really interesting about this and i didn't think about this before the show but this is maybe two or three years ago i was going on a fishing trip with a a friend of mine 
who's a doctor. And we were talking just about the future of medicine and what he thought would happen. He goes, well, arguably for like your family practice doctor, arguably it may be more efficient if you had a system where you went in, gave them your symptoms, you could put your finger on a pad. It took all your vitals, all those different things. And it ran through an algorithm or in this case, artificial intelligence to give you a diagnosis. Once you have it, the diagnosis comes out, it runs through the artificial intelligence and pops out the medicine you need. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure that'll work. He goes, it might actually work better. And his rationale was, if you think about the average doctor, how many experiences are they pulling from? Their own. 10, 20, 30,000 experiences or what they've read in research papers. But all of a sudden now, if you pull in millions upon millions upon millions of outcomes, do you potentially get a better outcome? Which is a little scary because if computers do everything, wasn't there a movie about computers taking over the world or robots and doing everything for us? Yeah, it's called The Terminator. I was thinking about a different one. <laughs> Will Smith's in Well, one. The Terminator's about that too. But I mean, it is a little scary. So what we thought today, we thought this would be fun, is to run through um, and see if AI actually gives good financial advice. So we did an AI generated financial tips. So the goal for this show is just to review what those financial tips are and see what our take is on what they've generated. We thought it'd be fun to, fun to do and introduce people to. Yeah, and it is, um, it's definitely part of our business now between the apps that are available and like the robo advising that's a bit available. But I, um, I, I probably will never come off this opinion. I don't, and the more people I talk to, I think the more convicted I am in this, I you're never going to replace financial advisors with robots because what a financial, what a robot can't do is really understand a family and like psychologically and emotionally how things are impacting them with their money. And I'll, I'll the other thing I'll say is we run, we run into a lot of situations like this. And I think it, there's a certain point in your investing career where a robo advisor and a 1-800 number is sufficient, but all families that are serious about their wealth building, they get to a point where the answers you get on a 1-800 number, that's not good enough anymore. Like that's general and that's a broad stroke. It's not a, a customized experience or it's not specific to you. So, you know, this is, it's going to be part of every business, right? But any talk of um, whether it's us or eliminating your banker, eliminating like your insurance person, um, I'll never believe that robots can replace all those people in people's lives. Here's where I see it becoming useful and there's a company out there. I won't say the name of it. We're not used to, we're not allowed to use them yet, but I'm going to use this as an example of how it can actually improve, improve outcomes for clients of ours. It's not going to replace our, it's not going to replace us because people still want to have someone to talk to and run the emotions by, but let's just say I can take a tax return, scan it into the computer, and because of artificial intelligence, they just automatically calculate whether you should do a, what, what the most optimal Roth conversion strategy is or all these things that come off a tax return that manually has to be done by an advisor that might take two, three, four hours that literally is just printing up the recommendations in front of your eyes. And actually it probably is gonna provide better outcomes because it's pulling from millions of experiences versus just the experience of us. And yeah. then we're gonna deliver that information in the context of a plan to somebody. And that technology does exist to some level. And if you think about artificial intelligence and AI learning, it just gets smarter as it gets more experience. I'll tell you a funny, funny story about this. So about a year ago, I'm like, I'm gonna learn what artificial intelligence is. Cause I'm like, I just should learn about it. So I ordered a textbook and it was like a coding textbook. I'm like, oh, you never read I'm that. in over my head. I'm already in over my head. I'm going to delegate this to the people, but I think that there's meaningful value going to come out of this for consumers. And as we go through and give these AI prompts and what the, the AI response was, I think what people are going to see is it's pretty generalized advice. 
And that's where the advisor is going to come in and just say, hey, here's the general advice, but how do we customize this to your very unique situation? Yeah. And a as we go through, you know, one thing I thought was very, uh, I guess, very insightful because the AI is pulling from all of the data available and it basically comes to a conclusion of like, these are the most basic things it's about basic. finance that you can execute. So, and it, but it's a good, to me, it's a good lesson and complicated doesn't mean that it's good or valuable. It might, it's being complicated just to be complicated. A lot of times that's probably a bad thing. If you can simplify your life, that adds like, to me, that adds more value, more efficiency, more ability to do other things. So, so just think about this, you're building a house. What's the first thing you got to do? Get a solid foundation. That that's yeah. what I see this as, as as I've read this script. It's the solid foundation. There's nothing yeah. fancy about it, but if most people just got the foundation right, the rest will kind of build upon itself. So let's go into the first one. Um, so we prompted the the AI technology and said, "What are five personal finance tips?" Surprisingly, first one: create a budget. I mean, it's probably the most basic thing that people can do and a couple ways to do a budget. You can list all your debts, which this says list all your monthly income and expenses, identify areas where you can cut back on spending, allocate funds for savings and debt payments. So that's general. It doesn't say, Hey, how are you going to create your budget? What kind of a budget? Because we, we talk about two different kinds. The one where you list your debts from largest to smallest, pay those off. Or we also list, you know, what's our lifestyle budget? Right. And those are, those are the things where like the human and to me, that's where the human interaction comes in. Part of our job is helping people understand their relationship with money. And that's like a budget item, understanding if you're a spender or a saver, like those are kind of the two basic points. And then from that, you know, this, okay, identify areas you can cut back and then allocate funds for savings and debt. You know, the, one of my most core messages, I think a basic message that we provide for clients and families we work with is like, if they introduce us to a younger person, a younger investor, let's get started. Well, there's nothing complicated about the message of let's get started, but it's in line with creating a budget, allocate funds, make it, make your saving and investing a priority. So this is where it's general, it just says allocate funds for savings and debt. It doesn't tell you which one to pay off. It's just giving the outline. So two, build an emergency fund, set aside three to six months of worth of living expenses, keep your emergency fund in a separate account, only use it for emergencies. That sounds like it's directly out of Dave Ramsey's book. And it well, might be, if you think where they're pulling from, if most financial people out there are gonna tell you that three to six months worth of living expenses. It's pretty common knowledge in our industry. So once again, very, very, very generalized information. Three, pay off debt. Prioritize, prioritize high interest debt, consider consolidating or refinancing debt to lower interest rates, make more than the minimum payment each month. So th this is interesting here because I think what we know about debt payment, like the debt snowball, where you start the smallest and work up to the biggest, probably the most effective because of the psychology of it. But the computer says prioritize high interest debt first because it's not calculating for emotion or psychology. It's only calculating for the optimum outcome. I was thinking exactly the same thing. So, so that's interesting. I'm already learning that it's not taking into account emotion. And which psychology. Of, of course yeah. it can. It, it can. It's computer until, I mean, that'd be scary if it learns how to have emotion. I don't want to talk about that. That's how <laughs> scary that is. Uh, four, save for retirement. Contribute to retirement accounts such as 401k or IRA. Take advantage of employer matching contributions. Increase your contributions as your income grows. Once again, very, very generalized information. All that is good information, but it leaves out what kind of a 401k. Should it be a Roth? Should it be traditional? Um, how much to put in your employer plan? Does it make sense to put it all there? Or should you max your employer plan out? get all the matching contributions and then go have your own self-directed IRA or Roth IRA and then go back to your, your employer plan. So all these little details, like this is general, 
and would get you started, but it's not going to elevate you to where you want to go. Now that said, I guess the follow-up show to this could be, what if we say, Hey, what type of retirement account should I contribute? And then let it work its magic from there. I think that that may be one of the other AI prompts that we're going to talk about. So you're telling me I haven't read far enough through the outline? Maybe. <laughs> Could have been. <laughs> it happens. And uh, track your credit score. Monitor your credit report for errors. Pay bills on time. Consider opening a credit card to establish credit history. And here, the, so the, this line must be from the, the robot, too. Remember, financial success is a journey and not a destination. By following these personal finance tips, you can set yourself on the path to a more secure financial future. I don't know if I could say it any better. Well, that's well, a great line right there. Elias, Molly, Molly's just been replaced by, by the, by the, by the AI. GPT. We're never going to get a human generated outline ever again. I'm actually going to steal. I'm going to steal this and use this with clients and families. Financial success is a journey and not a destination. That's a, that's a great line. I love that. You've already used it. You're hooked. Uh, AI prompt two, should you invest in a Roth or traditional IRA? So this is what you, you were mentioning. We're just going to dig down deeper into what, into what this can do. And, you know, this is a question we get from a lot of people. Should I do Roth? Should I do traditional? And I was actually listening to the money guys the other day and they were talking about, should you be doing a Roth 401k or traditional? And they brought it all back to, what's your income now versus what's your expected income in the future because of where tax rates could be. And then a little bit of what do you believe is going to happen with taxes in the future? Do you think tax rates are going up? Because there's an argument if, if you're, you know, in the top tax bracket, while Roth, Roth sounds highly, highly attractive because you never pay tax again, will you remain in the top, tax bracket of 40% in retirement. And most retirees don't have incomes of over $650,000. So oh. it begs the question, should I defer those taxes and pay it in a lower bracket that I may be able to control a little bit better? Um, and, and it got me thinking about my personal situation because I do all Roth. I do all Roth. And now that they're pushing back the required minimum distribution age to 75, does it change the recommendation to do all Roth and maybe you start taking the dollars today because I could probably figure out how to actually manage the taxation, how I take them out better than just saying, Hey, at 70, you have to start taking out 4% of this account. Yeah. That, so th this one's a hard, this one's a harder topic to always find what the best. Maybe it's not hard with AI. Well, may, maybe, yeah, it can maybe simplify. We're going to find out. Simplify the decision. But you're, you're dealing with some unknowns, right? Like what's your future income going to be? So what's your tax rate going to be? And, you know, the, the other thing you're dealing with is sometimes it maybe is as simple as if all of your money is in Roth, then you're eliminating some unknowns from your life. And for some investors, that is very valuable to them because, you know, their, fo their, their focus is they just want to eliminate some unknown risk. And then that's a good opportunity to do that. And I don't know that there's ever going to be, I don't know there's ever going to be a perfect answer for this question. Um, I do know my own, my own personal opinion for the vast majority of people utilizing Roth where you can either through your own IRA or through your company 401k plan is most often a good decision for most families and where they're at with their income and what their income will be all the time, even in the future. Here's why it's always going to be tough to give somebody a rock solid answer on this, because there's always the variable unknown of what will the government do with tax rates in the future. If we knew for sure what tax rates would be in the future, it would actually be a very easy mathematical question to answer. Yeah, if, yeah. But again, we don't if we had know. a crystal ball, everything would be I mean, easy. Me personally, I believe rates probably have to go up for some people, if not everybody. I mean, we're thirty one trillion dollars in debt. Like, how do you pay it off? 
and I always say this joke with people, and if you follow Dave Ramsey at all, you, you'll get this. If you owed $310,000 on your credit card, what would Dave Ramsey tell you to do? Pay it off. Right, but if you have a job making 150000 a year and 90% of it goes to your living expenses, what would he tell you to do then? Get another job. Get another job. Well, guess how the government gets another job? They increase tax. Yeah, your paycheck. Like, that's exactly how to do it. So I'm under the assumption that long term we're going to have an increased tax rate. That said, tax rates can be increased multiple different ways. It doesn't have to be an increase in the actual rate. It could be an increase in, or it could be a decrease in deductions you can take. It could be an increase in overall rate for everybody. So go to a flat tax. Let's be honest, if we had a 15 and a 25% flat tax, two income brackets with no deductions, that's a massive tax increase for every single person in America just about. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be a lot. I mean, they, especially depending on where the where those where the lines were drawn on where those brackets starts. I mean, there's a lot of people their effective tax rate is less than 15%. Oh, probably the majority of people. Majority. Because yeah. average household income in America is 75,000. Their effective tax rate is probably like 6%. I, right. I did this exercise with the client, husband and wife. They had two kids making their joint um, tax return showed $157,000. And they were talking to me how they needed all these tax deductions because they were in the 22% tax bracket. Well, you know what I did? I just pulled out the tax return and said, well, you paid like you paid $17,000 in taxes. That's your federal payment. And you made 150. So you want to defer dollars to save 11, 11 or 12%. That's what it really was. Their effective rate was like 11 or 12%. And they never thought about it that way. Cause all they see is, oh, I'm in the 22% tax bracket. Well, yeah. they didn't understand that taxes were incremental and they'd actually never looked at the dollar amount they were paying because why would they? It comes out every other week through their through their payroll. If you ask most people, how much did you actually pay in federal tax last year? The only number they're going to give you is how much they had to pay in at the end of the year. Oh, I paid in two grand. They don't know. Yeah, you, I mean, you'd have to look at your tax return to actually know the total. And yeah, most people it's either, well, I got a refund or I paid in. That's it's how that they simple. determine how much they paid in tax. Yeah. So what's interesting about um, the computer generated answers here, it's once again, pretty, pretty generic, but yeah. it says you have to figure it, you know, look at taxation, traditional IRAs are tax deductible income limits, but there's no income limits on Non-deductible Roth contributions are made after tax, but withdrawals in retirement are tax-free. So all the stuff we would we would um, generally talk about. It's very general, but here's here's what I think is interesting. It's kind of their closing remarks. It says, in general, if you're if you expect to be in a high tax bracket in retirement, a Roth IRA may, may be more advantageous. On the other hand, if you expect to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement, a traditional IRA may be more beneficial. It's a good idea to consult with a financial advisor to help you make an informed decision based on your individual circumstances and goals. So what's there interesting is they're admitting this is very, very specific to each unique client situation to provide the best outcome possible. It is, and I, I think one area of this decision and where a financial advisor can help because it's about individual circumstances and goals it's all, sometimes this is also a question of legacy money or money you want to leave for inheritance. Some families do and some families don't. Well, if you do, your, your time horizon then becomes so long and the potential tax liability of inherited money that you can probably make a very strong argument for Roth in those scenarios. So again, that's, but there's nothing about that and what the chat GPT generated but that would be that would be an exercise of working with someone who understands what your goals are. So then you can quantify if this is actually in line with what I want to accomplish or not. The next one's great because this is what everybody wants to know. Can the computer invest for me? And every time I think of think about um, and that's not the question. The question is, how should I invest my money? Five years ago, robo advisors were all the craze. Most of them underperform the market. 
in general. Most robo advisors have now become more of a third party asset manager because their cost of acquisition for clients is too high. And I don't know anybody that's using a robo advisor. Do you? Um, no, but I did. I had a conversation recently. This is not with a client, but a potential client. And um, they had been shopping different platforms. So th this person's kind of, they're on the fence. They want to work with somebody. Do they want to be a do-it-yourselfer? And I just, I made the comment, if I was going to be a do-it-yourself investor, I wouldn't use an app or a robo-advisor. I would use a company like Vanguard or Fidelity. And I'm not promoting those or recommending those for anyone. That's just what I said in conversation because those are reputable names. that. But I they like have robos. It, they do, but my point was like, you know, you use a use a brand that's known, been around for a long time, and trusted. And the, the the comment I got back was, "Well, I've never heard of those." So I thought that was very confusing that someone could be doing investment research and they're finding like these robo advisors, but they don't know two of the biggest institutional money managers that are, are available. They're not doing any serious research. Like nobody ser <laughs> nobody was doing. I, I mean, wasn't going to say that. Come on, them. man. It, 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 the largest asset manager in the world like you don't know who they are you're not you right and it was like the comment was kind of made to me like oh that sounds obscure and i didn't say i was nice i didn't say anything but i just was like you have to be kidding me they're not serious is this they a should, real conversation they, if, if you don't know who vanguard fidelity is you have no business trying to do this yourself well and yeah i i agree so how we should invest one says you should establish your financial goals before investing. It's important to determine what you're investing in and when you'll need the funds. This can help determine the appropriate investment strategy and asset allocation, which, yeah, I mean, you should do that. That How we do it is through a financial plan. So this leads to a bigger question. How can AI actually get plugged into financial planning? And I had this thought. I know we talked about this like nine months ago. I'm looking at Molly because I sent an email out. Is there a way that someday this will be able to predict when my client's going to need an excess distribution? Like it could track the distributions I make and be like, oh yeah, maybe call this client. They typically take X amount of dollars. It's probably time for them that they're going to need a distribution or based upon their situation, maybe they should make a tax payment. Somehow integrate into and learn how individual clients. I, I think so. I, I, I don't know why it couldn't if the, if it's tracking me, all of your if, spending habits, could right. could, it, could you plug provided, AI in and track your spending habits and it could give you daily recommendations on what you should do? Probably. I mean, I, I feel like just reading this, if you provide the data to it, it can come out with like an optimal, I guess an optimal, maybe not optimal outcome, but a very good decision, right? I mean, just this. And obviously the computer compiled this all from data, but these are all things that they're not specific to anyone, but they're correct. Right. Like I haven't really, I haven't read anything here where I think, yeah, that's probably not right. I, there's one coming up that we're going to argue here that okay. maybe I would say is maybe not all that correct. Uh, two, consider your risk tolerance, your willingness to accept the possibility of you losing money in exchange for potential high returns. One thing I like about what they said here. They didn't refer to the loss in percentage terms. They referred to losing money, losing money, not think about it when you have an investment and you, someone says, well, it's down 10%. 10% has no financial meaning. No. Like it's completely removed from investments. So let's flip around. You have a client that has a million dollars. I lost 10%. Well, it's only 10%. What if I told the client, hey, Mr. Client, your account went down $100,000? Now you're having a different conversation. Completely changes the meaning of it. It's almost like why the casino uses chips versus dollars on the table. It's a red chip, a blue chip, a green chip, black chip. It's not a 5, 10, 20, and 100. So I'm curious as to why they refer to it as money if they've already learned that, hey, money has more re resonates more with people than percentages because most advisors, we deal in percentage terms. Like we like to talk about percentages, average rate of return, how much you're down, how much you're up year to date. It's not 
we show the dollar amount, but we typically refer to it as percentage. And I think part of it is it's easier on the human psyche when we use percentages. Yeah, so, I, I agree. I agree with that because it's, you know, when, you, when you're when you just getting started or when you don't have very much money, the percentage, like the total dollar value, it's really irrelevant. But once you're working with the family and they, they have a lot of money saved up, well, a 10% move could be $200,000. And I think most people look at that and the initial reaction is, well, that could be a year salary. One, one, I'm going to disagree. This is out of, so far. I've read through most of these. And I'm not going to hit them all, but this one here is one where I think they've missed the mark. And it, this this can be important. But number six is minimize fees. It says fees can eat into your returns over time, so it's important to choose investments with low fees and expenses. Well, I'm going to give you a scenario. I'm going to play this on you. I have two investments. One returns 10%. One's average 10% a year. One's average 13% a year. Which one do you want? The average 13%. The one that averaged 13% after fees and expenses costs 5% a year to own. Do you still want it? So the, the net return. The net result. The net result. Yeah. After fees and expenses, one average 10, one average yes, 13. I'll pay more to get a better result. I this will. inherently says the one that averaged 10% and was free, you would choose over the one that had a bet better net result. So that's one issue that, that as I look through this, I don't think it almost needs more clarification. Like after fee return, cause everything has a fee on it. What's the hedge fund that just outperformed the market for like 20 straight years, but their fee was 30 or 40% a year. Think, uh, it's Renaissance, a Renaissance. Renaissance. Yeah. And they, they charged almost double what other funds charged when they were operating. But their net result right. was phenomenal. We all would have loved to invest in Renaissance and get the returns that they had for people. Yes. Most of us didn't have enough money, right, to get the minimum to get in there. But based upon the AI learning, that wouldn't have even been an investment option because this is telling us low fees and expenses, otherwise it eats into your earnings. It doesn't so, talk about net result. Yep. If if anyone was gonna find how the computer was wrong, you'd be you'd be the man for the job. I agree with you. I didn't even when I first read that, I thought, yeah, that makes sense. But from the context that you're talking about, yeah, that's that's right. The net result should be the goal. If it's a little bit more expensive, but the results better, well, you got what you paid for. Life is about outcomes. I'll give you an example. You're going to get heart surgery. I'm not, but Let's just say you are. If I was, okay. You got two choices. I'm going to, not even heart surgery. I'm going to use, Jeff, use this forever with long-term care insurance. You and I, we're going to go jump out of an airplane today. And you have the option. There's two parachutes. You get a brand new one that's guaranteed to open 99% of the time. Okay. That one costs $10,000. Or you can get a used one. It's guaranteed to open 85% of the time and it costs you 5,000. Which one are you going to choose? I'll take the $10,000 option if I'm jumping out of an airplane. Right, because it's about expected result. It's the same thing when you go to the doctor. All that matters if you're going to die is what's the outcome. You don't care what the cost is. Investing, if the outcome is better, why do I care what it costs? I'll it's say, irrelevant. I'll save 5,000 bucks and take a chance. No, you're not. No, I know better. I, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, and then I thought the last one here is pretty cool. Uh, what are three financial tips to prepare for a recession? And since we talk of recession has just consumed us for the last year, and whether we're in one or not, it's probably debatable. But the computer's response was a recession can have a significant impact in your personal finances. Here's three financial tips to prepare for a recession. One, build an emergency fund. Two is reduce debt. And three is invest in recession resistant assets. Assets such as certain types of bonds, real estate, defensive stocks may perform better in a recession than others. Consider diversifying your portfolio. I'd be really hesitant to take the computer's advice as to what asset classes to buy because you'd almost have to give it more context as to where we are in an asset cycle. I was just I was just thinking that. 
because this is gathered, this is just gathered from data available on the internet, but I don't know. Yeah, that, that's not very specific. Here's 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 a here's how we can do this. If you asked the AI learning this a year ago, it would have given you probably the same answer, right? We're prepare, preparing for recession, so we buy bonds. We bought bonds in the worst year for bonds ever. Right. Real estate didn't do well last year. It did the year before. Um. In defensive stocks, I, I, I don't know exactly what they would have done. But my point is, if it was really, really smart, it would have said you should just be in cash because cash was one of the best asset classes next to, your, yes, next to, uh, next to energy. So yeah, that I, would be that. Yeah, the correct answer from a year ago. I think what I see that the computer generated answers can do is give you pretty good generalized information. But I don't think it's going to enhance an outcome for a client. Most of these things are all things we already all know. I mean, let's be honest. What do we need to do to be financially healthy? Get a budget, live within our means, pay off our debt. I mean. And those that's never going to change. I didn't need a computer to tell me yeah, that. Yeah, and that'll never change. So I think that there's meaningful things here, but I don't know how people are going to adopt it. And I definitely don't think it's going to replace um, someone to help you get the right outcome. In fact, there's several times in this sequence that they refer to getting a financial professional to help you with these answers. Now, does that mean us as financial professionals won't utilize technology to get better at our job? We absolutely will. I mean, I think about how far financial planning's come in 20 years. So I've been doing this. It used to be financial profiles and that was really designed to sell people insurance to now, and we print it out and put it in a bound up packet to now we're just presenting scenarios to people on a computer screen right in front of them and changing them at the click of a button so they can kind of run their own their own financial life. So I'm sure technology like this is going to become very, very relevant in our industry. I'm not sure it's going to really help individuals who are trying to do this themselves let the computer take over and, and run for them. Yeah, I, and I agree with that. And I think here's why I've over the last couple of years, I think one thing that I've really started to um, really understand and probably exercise with clients and people we're working with, ultimately people, people want to be told what to do. I mean, that's why they're working with professionals and you have to, there, there's some balancing act and asking the right questions and delivering that message. But here's what I know. Can I take every, can I take someone's financial data and put it into a computer and give them a basic answer about what they should do? I can, but I think what people really want is they want they want us to say if I was you, this is exactly how I would do it. And then and then ultimately they can decide if they're going to trust that advice and that philosophy and, and work and work within it. But, but I think that's the value that artificial intelligence, at least like this outline that was generated, it's not providing is in this situation, this is exactly what I think you should do. Um, all of these tips, all of these things that were generated, that's, they're all, they can get you on the right path. I certainly to, get you pointed in the right direction. I have to tell you what's so ironic about this. I'm looking at my computer and this email just popped up and, and this is the, this is the title. Let's get real. Are human beings old news? Are you? And it's all it's about, it's, a, it's an us. advertising. It's buying on us and then you got the ad. It's, it's an advertising company. And what they're looking to do is get financial advisors. Let's see, what's the ad? It says, artificial intelligence is now featured in everyday magazines. It means something. That's why you need a navigator like, I won't say the name. Our artificial advertising experts have reduced the cost of a $50,000 campaign to $7,500. And this is about insurance marketing. But I just think it's ironic. This is how much people are talking about this. And that's why we wanted to do a show on it. So if anybody has any questions, go to our website, btwellshow.com. Uh, hit the contact button. We'll, we'll air your question live on our next show. Uh, I guess... The thing didn't create me a, a closing like it did the, the beginning. 
Oh, that's so you sad. don't have anything to say. I don't have anything to say. I thought the computer was supposed yeah, to generate the... me the clothes like the beginning. Although I did like the beginning better than mine. Um, with that said, I want to thank everybody for listening or watching the show. Uh, until next time, hopefully I have a better computer-generated clothes. I want to thank everybody for listening.